now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. In fact, that creaking door is going to be a very important part of the next hour here of Classic Radio Theater as we're going to travel into the Inner Sanctum for an episode of Inner Sanctum Mysteries. This episode was originally broadcast April 9th, 1946, Lady with a Plan. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present... Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening. And welcome once again, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Don't hesitate, come right in. Once you get used to these grim surroundings, you'll never leave. Nobody ever does. Once you're in, you're out. <laughs> this is the kind of place that grips you. Mm-hmm. The kind of place where the bars hold and no holes are barred. So come right in. Your only ticket of admission is your promise not to tell anybody about anything you may happen to hear tonight. <laughs> Now for tonight's tale, Lady with a Plan, written especially for Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff, and starring Elspeth Eric. It concerns a lady living in strange confinement and her fiendish scheme for escape. Moore Penitentiary is a sprawling mass of gray granite on a deserted landscape. To this grim and forbidding place has come a man with a purpose, to visit with Gladys Cross. He's a newspaper writer, and she is tomorrow's feature story. It's not a pretty story. I'll tell it right from the beginning. I'm no stranger to Moore Prison. I was a bride when I first came here. Wife of the warden. First lady of Moore Prison. <laughs> what a laugh. It was a strictly business proposition. Edward got a wife and I got security in what I thought was a convenient way of life. But after two years of living like a prisoner in a house that was inside the walls of a jail with a man who was 15 years older than I was, I'd had enough. But Edward had other ideas. <laughs> Divorce. <laughs> you don't mean a word of it, Gladys. Stop telling me what I mean. Will you give me a divorce? When you're feeling less excited, we can discuss this sense of... No, you can't put it off. I've had all I can take. I don't understand you, Gladys. I've been a model husband. Model husband? You've treated me the way you treat your prisoners. You don't beat them. You grind away at their nerves until their minds are so much mush. I'm getting out before it's too late. You're staying here with me where you belong. If you won't give me a divorce, I'll leave without it. Gladys, don't be a fool. No matter where you go, I'll bring you back. And I don't want to hurt you. You can't threaten me. Not you, my dear. I'm thinking of him. Him? How do you... What are you talking about? (laughs) So there is a man. You're inhuman. No, dear. Just a model husband. Trying to keep his home intact. (laughs) There was another man. Stephen Bromley and I were in love. Drawn together by a hate for more prison. Stephen was the assistant warden. I got word to him that I had to see him, to meet me that night at our secret rendezvous, a deserted side road two miles from the prison. When I got there in my car soon after dark, I didn't have long to wait. Stephen? Yes, Gladys. I came as fast as I could. Here, get in the car so we can talk. Something is wrong. I spoke to Edward this afternoon. He refused the divorce, and he threatened me if I left. He suspects there's someone else. What? He doesn't suspect it's me. You, his assistant, he'd never suspect you. He will eventually. We've got to get away. But Edward threatened me. Edward, Edward. Look ahead, Gladys. You know what'll happen. 
You've seen it happen to the prisoners. You'll snap. Your nerves will give way. He'll, he'll break you. You can stop it. You know there's no way out. There is. If your game. I know what you're thinking, but that's impossible. We could never get away with it. If we could, would you do it? Tell me how. Bucky Briggs. Briggs, the life. Uh -huh. I can have him transferred to work in the laundry. Assigned to handle your stuff when you bring it down. What are you getting at? Bucky hates the warden worse than you do. Even half the chance he'd strangle him in a second. Now talk to him. Begin to feel sorry for him. Let him think you want to help him make a break. Then what? Then all we've got to do is give him the chance to use his hands on Edward. For two hours we talked. By the time we parted, our plan had been worked out in detail. It was a plan for murder. Murder with clean hands. <laughs> The next morning, I took my soiled linens and drove across the prison yard to the laundry. Bucky Briggs came out to the car. He didn't even look up at me. Where is it? In the back of the car. Here, let me open the door for you. I've heard quite a bit about you, Briggs. You want to take your fresh stuff home? But I don't really believe what they say. Look, lady, the warden needles me enough. I don't have to take it from you, too, see? Well, I don't know what you mean. You I want just... your fresh laundry, don't you? In a minute. I just want you to know that I'm interested in your case, Bucky. So's your husband. I'll get your laundry now. All right, Bucky. The seed was planted. All it needed was time. I began to plan the visits to the laundry in advance. The remarks I would use. Stop intimately. And at close quarters, out of the earshot of others. And after a month, it came like the fulfillment to a patient prayer. I was at the laundry waiting for Bucky to bring my clean stuff to the car. He came out, stepped into the car, took a quick glance around, and suddenly slipped close to me. It's up to you, baby. Get me out of here and then it'll be you and me all the way. A deal? I've got it all figured out, Bucky. You don't waste time, beautiful. Give me the dope. Tomorrow, when I come back, be ready. Check. I'll get word to some friends to pick me up on the outside. Just... One more thing. My husband. It'll be a pleasure, baby. I made a final check with Stephen and then everything was set. I was sitting in the car the next day when Bucky came out. I reached over the front seat and opened the rear door for him. Get in, Bucky. And stay down. Spot me. It's been fixed. The guard's busy on the other side. Where are we going? To the house. What about the warden? He's in town today. Stop asking so many questions. Okay, baby, this is your show. Just make it good. This is the back of the house. There's not a soul in sight. Now follow me out, hurry. That's the cellar door. Open it, Bucky. Right. Now what? The coal bin. Hide in there. You may have a long wait. I got patience, baby. I've been waiting two years for this. When it's clear, I'll call you. Three bangs on the steam pipe. I get you. That's when I take over. Our room is directly overhead on the second floor. Check. All right, Bucky. Get in the bin. Hold on, baby. That's no way to say goodbye. What? I like them personal. Like this. No, not now, Bucky. Now... <clears throat> Well, that's more like it. Something to remember you by. Edward returned an hour later. I was puttering around the dinner table too jittery to sit and wait for the commotion to break. And then, quicker than I expected, it happened. Sir, that must be the break. I know they can't get away with a break here. Hello. What the devil's happened? Briggs, form a searching party and wait for me. I'm coming over. Briggs is broken out. Can he saw of how he did it? No, but he won't get far. I'll find him. And when I do, I'll break him for good. That a boy, Warden. You show him. But instead of listening to that alarm, you should have paid more attention to that wife of yours. 
Because that siren is cooking up something that'll be a real scream. <laughs> Oy vey. April 9th, 1946, Inner Sanctum Mysteries on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. It's a big, bold story set in the heartland of America, along the edge of Lonely Mountain. I am open for business. And so Big William Gorgon, played by handsome Michael James, fiercely set down his Midwest roots. Oh, darling, we're going to sell bathrobes and raise chickens. Set as adoring wife, Wilhelmina, portrayed by beautiful Glenda Olson. Oh, I love our store, Will. But they hadn't counted on Big Ralph's bathrobes and cattle store coming to town. Oh, Will, Will, what will we do, Will? Will had a plan, a way of facing off against tough Big Ralph. We're going to change the face of America. We're going to advertise. And for what? The print and broadcasting and bus benches are going to tell people who we are and where we are. What's a bus? And so the story of how one man brought advertising to the heartland. Oh, Will, will it work? It will. Well, my name ain't Will, Wilhelmina. Well, you got to advertise or we'll die. And so the greatest marketing story of all time is here. Advertise or die, dopey. Put your message on this national advertising platform. Email classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Classicradiotheater at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now more of Inner Sanctum Mysteries. April 9th, 1946, Lady with a Plan. And now, back to our Lady with a Plan. (laughs) And what a plan. Her husband, Warden Cross of Moore Penitentiary, is searching for Bucky Briggs, an escaped convict. But Gladys has hidden Bucky in the cellar of the house. He's waiting there now to kill the warden. And Gladys, she's waiting too. For murder. I went up to bed after Edward left. And lay there tense. The sirens had stopped. For hours, there was dead quiet everywhere. Then close to midnight, I heard the door open downstairs. It was Edward. I could tell from his footsteps that he was tired, defeated. I lay perfectly still, waiting for him to come in. That is... Yes? You're still up? Yes, Got away. It's incredible. You got away. And no one knows how. I didn't answer. He was a different person. Harried. Shaken. I watched him as he undressed. He looked suddenly older than ever. And I felt a sickening revulsion at the dejected spectacle he had become. I lay perfectly still as he slipped into bed and fell off to sleep. He was fast asleep now. I reached down over the side of the bed for my shoe and softly tapped its heel against the steam pipe. Edward was still asleep. I lay back and waited. Slowly, slowly, and Bucky's silhouette stood outlined in the half-light from the hall. He moved quietly into the room right past me. In a moment, his big, hulking figure, looking more gorilla-like than ever, stood towering over Edward's bed. I saw his hands reach out cautiously for Edward, but just a moment too late. Get away from me. Get away. This is the payoff, one. Oh, Edward was awake. And like a flash, he twisted out of Bucky's reach. I sat there paralyzed as he broke to the floor. Edward, Edward tried to tear Bucky's hands with the throat. But Bucky held on tighter and tighter, digging his fingers deeper into the soft fleshiness of Edward's throat. Good. 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 I didn't move. I didn't speak. And he understood. Gladys, you'll never get away with this. Shut him up, Bucky. Easy, baby, easy. Another squeeze of his throat. Just 
Just like you wanted him. I want to see for myself. You don't have to. The night twisted, Nick. It stays twisted. Dead. He's dead. Now get me out of here. There's a rope and a scathing hook behind the cellar door. Check. Stick close to the house until you reach the hedge. Then out across the south wall gate. Check. All right, I'll go. Don't you forget something? What? Come here. Oh, please, step, Bucky, please. <laughs> Well, you gotta do this more often. I'm getting the light. Please go. Okay. Just one thing. Remember, give me two hours before you turn in the alarm. I'll be waiting for you out there. Goodbye, baby. As soon as he was gone, I glanced at my watch and followed the second hand around twice. Now I was ready. You know, you know, who is this? It's Mrs. Cross. Bucky Briggs was hiding in our cellar all the time. He's killed my husband. What? Do something before it's too late. Which way'd you go? Toward the south wall. Right. I put the phone down. My part was over. The rest was up to Stephen in the main tower. I waited five seconds, ten seconds, twenty seconds... Then all of a sudden it came like a million shrieking demons. From the window I saw the long fingers of the searchlights pointed at the south wall. And pinned beneath the glaring lights was Bucky, frantically pulling his way up the rope. I watched as the bullets hit all around him, kicking puffs of powder off the stone wall. One of them had to find his mark. Bucky shut it. Then caught himself. He was hit. He had to fall, but he didn't. Hand over hand, he started up again, higher and higher. He was hit again, but he didn't stop. And then before I could realize what had happened, he was over the top and gone. Hello? Mrs. Crash? You found him on the outside? No, not to trace him. Bucky got away. But how? He was hit twice. That's right. The car must have picked him up. But we'll get him. Unless those bullets kill him first. He's got to die. He can't live. He mustn't live. Oh, don't worry, Mrs. Cross. We'll find him. Dead or alive. I hung up. Dazed. Now Bucky was out there. Waiting for me. The lights. The machine gun. He knew now that I'd double-crossed him. And he was waiting out there to kill me. The next week was a nightmare. Edward's funeral, the messages of condolence. No chance to see Stephen alone. And then one night a week later, he came to me. Nervous, worried. We messed it up, Gladys. No trace of Briggs, which means he's alive and out there. That's not so safe for you. But we're safe here. Of course, Gladys. But we just happen to be leaving here. Oh, no, Stephen, I'm not going. That's impossible. The new warden's arriving next Tuesday morning. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Gladys, even if you could stay on, I'd argue against it. But what about Briggs? It's a big world out there, remember? We'll get lost in it, you and I. So lost that no one will ever find us. Not even Briggs. Oh, say you'll go. Well, I have no choice, I suppose. Good girl. Now, listen, I've got it all figured out. My resignation is in, takes effect next Tuesday night. Tuesday morning, you take the train to New York and head straight for the Hotel Empress. Don't budge out of your room. I'll be along in the evening, okay? You're not listening. I was thinking of something. What? Something Edward said when he died. Hmm? You'll never get away with this. Tuesday morning, I was on the train for New York. It was a short, pleasant trip. And my fears began to disappear. Once I reached the crowds of Grand Central Station, I knew I'd be safe. I threaded my way through the crowd. Just one of thousands of people. And suddenly there was a hand on my shoulder. Hello, baby. Bucky. What, what are you doing, doing here? How did you find me? I've been waiting for you, baby. Like I said... I got friends back there. The grapevine tipped me off when you was leaving, and here I am. But, but, but I... The bullets, <laughs> just like nothing. Takes a lot to stop me. 
Come on, let's get out of here before some folks bust me. No, wait, Bucky, just just give me a minute. I've got to call my hotel to, to hold my room for me. Can't I wait? Well, if I don't call, they'll cancel it. Mm, okay, but only a minute. Make your call over there so I can keep my eye on you, sweetheart. I don't want to lose you. Bucky had nodded toward a drugstore. It was a slim chance, but it was better than I'd expected. I entered the store... Made a quick dash for the other door. I flung it open and raced madly toward the taxi stand. Over my shoulder, I caught a glimpse of Bucky. He'd seen me. Hey, wait a minute. I ran to the cab and jumped in. Hotel Empress in a hurry. And lose that cab behind us. Okay, lady, this is the Empress. We shook that other cab. I headed toward the entrance. Just as I entered, I caught a quick glimpse of a cab pulling up to the curb, but I couldn't stop to see. I rushed into the hotel, up to my room, and locked myself in. Before I even had time to think, the phone rang. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Cross. I just sent a gentleman up to see you. I banged the receiver down. So it was Bucky in that cab. I had to get out. There was only one elevator, and I couldn't try the stairs because I didn't know which Bucky would use. I had only one way out, the desperate way. And I decided to take it. And the conclusion of Inner Sanctum Mysteries, Lady with a Plan, from April 9th, 1946, follows these important words. Thank you for joining me here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE. 833-34-BIBLE. Are you suffering with arthritis or osteoporosis? Do you have diabetes? Did you know that these are just two of the hundreds of diseases that have seen improvement with Dr. Wallach's incredible longevity products? You can't get them at a health food store. The only way to get them is to call us at 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Do you have heart disease, fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure? Do you have a terrible time losing weight? Dr. Wallach can help. He was a veterinarian and cured diseases in animals. He felt that he could do the same for humans, so he became a physician. Over 50 years of research and helping people like you goes into every bottle of Dr. Wallach's amazing discoveries. Do you want to feel better? Learn how to treat the cause of your problem rather than covering up the symptoms with drugs. Call 800-214-0065. That's 800-214-0065. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Inner Sanctum Mysteries, Lady with a Plan, as it was originally broadcast April 9th, 1946. I unlocked the door. I turned off the lights. And I took a pair of scissors from my handbag and waited behind the door. I wasn't a moment too soon. Come in. I pressed against the wall behind the door and watched it open slowly. Then, leaping forward, I plunged the scissors into his back. Oh, oh. oh Alice, this is me, Stephen. Stephen! You said you were coming at night. I, what? I left earlier to surprise you. Why didn't you phone? I did. You haven't arrived yet. Uh, oh, Stephen! Surprised to see me, huh? Hey, who's that? Steve Bromley. You done him in. 
Nice work, baby, but why the chase? I, I had to run. I... I understand. The screw was following you. Thought you'd lead him to me. Yes. yes. Sure, well, you did right, baby, but let's get out of here. No. You've got no choice. Come on. Let go of me. Shut up. You'll have the whole hotel on that. Let go of me. Come on, baby. You're on break. Get away from me. Come on. What's going Get... on in here? I'll stick holding. I'm getting out of here. There we are, both of you. Looks at that guy on the floor. You ain't going anywhere for a long time. Let's see you. Here, reach, chum. This ain't no toy. Neither is this. Oh, my hand. Now, let's get going. There isn't much more to tell. You were at the trial. You know the rest. I'm back at Moore Prison for good. He's a real prisoner this time. And Bucky, he's got a few hours before they take him to the chair. Mrs. Krauss? What is it? Bucky Briggs is just outside the cell. He's due to go in 15 minutes. He wants to talk to you before he goes. To me? Yes. All right. Doesn't matter anymore. Briggs, it's okay. Five minutes, Bucky. And we're just outside. Hello, baby. I don't have anything to say to you. Yeah, but I got something I want to ask you before I go. It's bothered me ever since I was nabbed. All right, ask it. Why didn't you leave when I asked you to back in that hotel room? Why? <laughs> what are you laughing about? As if you didn't know. You know what? If I went with you, I knew it was the end for me. What are you talking about? You wanted to kill me. Me kill you? How do you figure it oh, out? Oh, stop acting, Bucky. It doesn't make any difference now. All right, so I double-crossed you the night you escaped. I called the tower exactly two minutes after you left. You what? So that's how they tricked me up so fast. I thought you knew. What a sap I've been. What a sap. Bucky! You dirty double crosser. Bucky, keep away. Oh. Help! Double crosser. Help, my throat! Double Get crosser. Get your hands off. Break your off. neck. Help! Better go, Briggs, or I'll shoot. You're too late, screw. You... She... She's dead. You broke her neck. It don't make no difference now. You can't kill me twice. Now, there's a nice, gentle character, that Bucky. Just a little too restless with his hands. So here and now, I'm starting a new movement for Inner Sanctum Mysteries. From now on, our slogan should be, when you grab a throat, stop and think, then stroke, don't choke. <laughs> Before we say goodnight, friends, here's an epitaph for the tombstone of Gladys Cross. Here lies a good heart rent asunder by a man with a soul full of thunder. Her sweetheart named Stephen tried to help her get even. Now they all live in peace six feet under. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is I Hate Blondes by Wolf Kaufman. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown. And starring the famous Broadway and Hollywood star, Orson Welles, in The Lonely Heart's Killer. Or, How to Keep a Heart from Being Lonely in One Quick Slip. <laughs> I'll be listening for Orson Welles in next week's Inner Sanctum story. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> April 9th, 1946, Inner Sanctum Mysteries on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds. But check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net.
you clean everything else in your house, why don't you clean the air? It's easy to do with an Eden Pure Thunderstorm air purifier. They're under $200 for a three pack. You can put one in the kitchen, you can put one in the living room, you can put one in that room that you know you always flush. Go to EdenPureDeals.com, put in my promo code CLASSIC3, and you'll save 200 bucks. EdenPureDeals.com, discount code CLASSIC3, and you'll also get free shipping. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we start a new year's truly Johnny Dollar story. This one, the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote Matter. This episode originally broadcast April 9th, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Oh, hi, Harry. What's on your mind? I have a case for you, a very important one. Good. Tell me about it. John, did you ever hear of Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote? Lord, who... Say that slowly, will you? Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote. Sorry, I left my kilts and bagpipes on the other side of the drink. Huh? Oh. (laughs) Yeah, I'm feeling real sharp this morning. But what about this Laird Douglas Douglas something or other? Uh, Can you come down here to Philadelphia and see me? I hate to be so blunt about it, old boy, but what's in it for me? A nice retainer fee in any event. Well, good. And, of course, expenses and your regular commission if anything happens to Laird Douglas Douglas. Of Heatherscope. Uh, why, yes. Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. Oh, oh John. Yeah? Uh, come down by plane, will you? The first one you can get. Urgent, huh? Yes, John. Very. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Harry Branson at the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscote matter, whoever Laird Douglas Douglas is, and whether investigation is the proper term at this point, who knows. In any event, well... Expense account item one, 2250, air transportation and miscellaneous, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. For a change, I decided to stay at the Benjamin Franklin, not only because it was convenient to Harry Branson's office on Walnut Street, that is, the office of Philly Mutual Liability and Casualty, but because I'd heard it was a nice hotel. It was. And it was convenient to everything else in the center of town. Theaters, good restaurants, nice stores, even a nightclub. Well, anyhow, when I got to my room, I found a half dozen urgent messages that Harry had called. Pretty good indication that his lordship, Douglas Douglas, of... or at least this case, was pretty important... So instead of bothering to unpack, I had the bellboy dump my luggage, tipped him, and was standing there debating whether I'd better forego a quick shower and change of clothes when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. John, didn't you get my messages? Why haven't you called? I've been waiting to hear from you. What's wrong? Hey, take it easy, Harry. I just this minute got in. Oh, well, I hope you're coming right on over here to my office. What's the matter? Something happened to this client of yours? No, not yet. But being you, you're expecting the worst, huh? And look, you still haven't told me a thing about this emergency or whatever you want to call it. John, it is an emergency because of the time element. You see, why do we waste time on the phone? Well, this was your call, not mine. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I'll be waiting for you. And Harry, I'll be there. Still knowing nothing whatsoever about what was going on, I decided I'd better be prepared for anything. So I slipped the 38 Colt out of my bag and took it along. Expense account item two, 65 cents, cab fare. I've said it before when I handled the Amerigo case for him. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a worrywart. So I kind of hoped he was making the usual mountain out of the usual molehill this time. However, when my cab pulled up in front of his office building, he was standing waiting on the sidewalk out front. Hey, I keep the change. Thank you, sir. John, John, what took you so long? Huh? Thank goodness you're here. Harry, what are you doing out here? Lose your office or just forget the key? I almost wish I had. John, we have a problem. A serious one. Yeah, with Laird Douglas, Douglas of, uh... Heatherscote, Heatherscote. He's up in my office yeah, now. Sounds like international intrigue. Has Scotland declared war on us or something? This is no time for levity. He's up in the office now and you must take over immediately. This is a very serious situation. Come. Okay. 
Oh, now, what's it all about? Has Laird Douglas died and... Oh, no, no, you said he was up in your office. And I'm sure you don't mean just his body. Yes, he's there with Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. Kelly Van... Huh? Are you kidding? I certainly am not. You see, she insists that you act as his bodyguard. Oh, now, wait a minute, Harry. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately for you... 13th floor, please. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, I said 13th floor, operator. Please, quickly. Yes, sir. So, Harry? Unfortunately... Young man, will you please start this elevator immediately? Got to wait for the signal, sir. Signal? This is an emergency. Take off immediately. Emergency? Yes, it involves Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope. Oh, well, sure, if it's... Who? Good man, good man. (sighs) Okay. Now, you were saying, Harry... (laughs) Was I? Uh, unfortunately something. Oh, oh, yes, of course. Fortunately for you, she was quite cognizant of the fact... Who was cognizant? Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten. She knew about the excellent work you did for us in connection with the Ricardo Amerigo case not long ago. Excellent detective work, she called it. Thirteenth floor. You remember the case, Ricardo, the concert violinist who disappeared, presumably. Yeah, I remember. And your almost intuitive deduction that he wasn't dead at all, but had merely staged the whole thing to make him Uh, look as the... Ah, Harry. Oh, yes, of course. Thirteenth floor. Uh, You mean uh, Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van... Excuse me, mister, but I'm getting signals from the other floors. Mm, Quite right, you should. As I started to say, John... She is one of our biggest personal policyholders. Good, good. But uh, hadn't we better get into your office and meet her? Oh, yes, yes. But I want you to know about the personal premiums. Alone, they run to something over $20,000 a year. Mr. Please. Well, she is an important client. Yes, yes. And that's why I didn't... Mr. Williams, I didn't hesitate to accede to her request that you be called in on this case. I called you and here you are. Mr. Please. Hmm? Oh, well, get us up to the... Oh, oh, we're here. (laughs) Why didn't you tell us? Come, John. Mister, if I was to tell you what I'd like to, I'd... My office is right this way, John. Come, please. Hey, look, you better calm down, Harry, and give me the dope on this case right from the beginning. Yes. Yes, I'd better. All right. Mrs. Peter Malcolm Kelly Van Pyten is a very important client, has been for years. So you said. But there are a lot of things you haven't said, like, uh, what has she got to do with this Laird Douglas character, and why is he so important? It's this way, John. The policy on him runs to $5,000. No double indemnity, which is good. As a matter of fact, the policy on him was purely a favor to Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. You know, considering such short life expectancy and all. No, I don't know. Is he in his dotage or something? Well, hardly. Or are you being facetious again? But you said... Hey, how old is he? His birthday is next month, May 7th to be exact. He'll be four years old. Four? That's right. Short life expectancy? Of course. You see, John... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Ah, uh, some horrible disease or something, huh? What's the matter with him? John, you wanted this from the beginning, so I'll give it to you from the beginning. Okay, but Harry, If it you're... hadn't been for Mrs. Van Pyten's own policies totaling something in the neighborhood of half a million, uh, more in fact... Harry... Why, we'd never have written the one on Lord Douglas Douglas of Heatherscoat. So, now we've cleared that up. Harry, we passed your office three or four doors ago. Hmm? Oh, yes. <laughs> But, uh, as I'm sure you understand, I wanted to give you some of the background before you talk with Mrs. Van Pyten. After all, you asked for it. Yes, yes, I guess I did. But, uh, what you've given me so far has landed me smack dab in the Department of Utter Confusion. And I'm beginning to think maybe I have company. Oh, where? Who? Right here. You, Harry. Now, look. Why don't we quietly stroll into your office and let me get the whole thing from Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten herself? Or better still, from Laird Douglas Douglas. But you couldn't. Of course not. What? At least not from him. Why not? John, will you please stop joking? Who's joking? This is serious business. Very. (sighs) Look, Harry. Yes? There is one thing I'd like to talk over before we go in to see him. Them. Somebody. Yes? Well, apparently the life and or welfare of this Laird Douglas Douglas is in danger. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I thought I'd made that very clear to you. Yeah, well, you said you've written only a $5,000 policy on him. That's right, $5,000. And purely yeah, as a... Yeah, 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 I know all about that. Now, look, I don't want to seem crass about it, Harry, but my commission, if anything were to happen to him, wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Which is precisely why I told you you will be paid a retainer while you're on the case. A most generous one. A generous one? By you? By Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten. How much? Well, John, now, mind you, this may not require your services for more than a week or so. As bodyguard, that is. How much? And, of course, she has authorized an expense account. Ah. But, mind you, John, not the usual kind that you seem to have the knack of piling up beyond all reason. Clearly, a completely honest, legitimate accounting... Harry, how much? But as a matter of cold fact, 
I have assured her that it will total no more than the amount of the retainer she is prepared to pay you. Any more than that, and, uh... Well, you'll have a lot of explaining to do. Harry, how much is this retainer to be, if I take the case? I might even go so far... $750 per week, or a fraction thereof, and I am sure you will agree that that... What's the matter, John? Seven fifty a week, plus expenses, when there's only a $5,000 policy involved? That's right. But if this four-year-old Laird Douglas Douglas of... of, of, of Heather Scott. Yeah. If he's only worth a $5,000 policy... And what was that crack about short life expectancy? John, I told you he is already four years old. He... Oh, look, start all over again, will you, Harry? Yes. No, on second thought, perhaps you were right. Perhaps you'd better get the details directly from Mrs. Peter Malcolm, Malcolm Kelly, Kelly Van Pyten. I know. Now, look, Harry, I, I think I'd better. I'd better get it from somebody. You're Incidentally, not... John, you understand, of course, that your services will be required only during the affair at Bala Kinwood. And not one minute no, there. No, I don't understand. What's Bala Kinwood? Out around Westchester, outside the city, one of the suburbs. Very nice suburb, too. That is where Laird Douglas Douglas... I've had this code. Yes, John, that is where he will appear. And you or Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, or both, if you think his life will be in danger. Exactly. Oh, John, I knew you were just joking me all the time. I wish I knew. Uh, here we are, and everything will be clear. Yeah. Oh, thank heavens, dear Mr. Branson. I was afraid something had happened to you. You were gone so long, you really had me quite worried. Oh, I'm so sorry, but I had hoped to tell Mr. Dollar something of this affair, and I'm afraid we loitered on the way up. Uh, Mrs. Kelly Van Pyten, this is Mr. John Dollar. Oh, you wonderful, wonderful man. I'm so glad that you've agreed to take on this assignment. You see, Laird Douglas Douglas means everything to me. And I have the utmost confidence in you. I'm sure Laird Douglas will, too. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but where is he? Uh, why, yes, Mrs. Van Pyten, what's happened to him? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, my dear. He's all right. But after all, he is so temperamental. I fear he got a bit impatient waiting for you. And I know you'll forgive him. You will, won't you? Yes, yes, of course, but where is he? He's asleep, Mr. Branson, in your inner office. He sat down in your chair and fell fast asleep. Oh, if I could only relax that way. But you must meet him, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I'd certainly like to. Of course you would, and I know he'll want to meet you. Gently now. Oh, good, he's awake. Oh, no... That's Laird... Laird Douglas, Douglas of Heatherscote. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Hey, oh, John! Hey, Douglas, Douglas, no! Somebody. Let go of Mr. Dollar's leg. Douglas, dear! Douglas! Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's, uh, intriguing? Well, tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, I've handled some pretty doggy cases in my time, but never as a pooch's bodyguard. But suddenly this one begins to smell much too strongly of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. No doubt about it, he's living the dog's life in this case. Part one of the five-part years truly Johnny Dollar story, the Laird Douglas Douglas of Heatherscope Matter, from April 9th, 1956, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Would you do me a favor and thank this radio station and support their advertisers? It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we're here on your favorite radio station. If you miss a day on this station, you do not have to miss a single episode of Classic Radio Theater. Our shows are available through iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Amazon's Audible app. Just search for Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. And our shows 
are available through my webpage, where you can hear our shows on demand, learn more on classic radio collecting, and contact me. That's classicradio.stream. Classicradio.stream. And please, tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs> 